Hello there and welcome to Complete Games and we continue with the notes from Gabrielle on Genesis Part 2. If you haven't already caught up with Part 1 then I'll leave a link in the top right hand corner. But we pick up where we left off with Nida having discovered that Gabrielle was concealing an element shard from her and they both fell out over the matter. So sit back, relax and enjoy Part 2 of the notes from Gabrielle on Genesis. That other voice whispered to me again while Nida and I rode in silence towards the edge of the wheel. It reassured me that the element I'd recovered was my own to keep and asked me why I'd let this girl draft me into fighting for a cause that was none of my concern. Was I really in such a hurry to die again after so little time back among the living? We stopped to rest and eat in an alpine meadow. While Nida was gathering berries, I saw my moment. I took advantage of the training she'd given me over the previous days to take one of the striders and ride it away on my own for the canyonlands. I wasn't sure if she'd be able to call the strider back at a distance, but it's also possible she decided just to let me go. I was free now to use the power of this great machine of hers to my own ends. I rode my stolen strider back towards where I thought the canyons might be, searching for the vein of ore we'd found before. Every so often I'd stop the mechanical juggernaut and force it to blast at the rock outcroppings, dismounting to dig through the mounds of rubble looking for the telltale violet glow of pure element. It didn't take me long to realise that all my methods of reckoning direction or distance were useless in this place. By night there was no pole star to follow north. In fact, all the stars were strange to me. By day the miraculous miniature sun threaded its wheels on its odd straight track with no regard for east or west. I was utterly lost again in the garden. I wonder if the girl was pressing on without me to fight the invader in the other wheel. If she ever tried to find me in the immensity of that landscape, I saw no sign. My dreams were fevered by regret during the time I'd fled from Nida. In the dark, I relived the helpless rage that set me after the claim jumpers who followed me to search my tent. Those men said I had no right to stay in their new American state. They threatened to bring me to the local authorities to hang for some invented crime. Their word against mine. I broke away and circled back through the forest to kill them. But they saw me come in and overpowered me. I spat at them, gave them ideas by telling them what I would have done to each of them if only I'd managed to catch them alone. And they made me regret that. With my last breath I cursed them, promising them that what they had stolen from me would only bring them sorrow and torment. By daylight, I fumed at myself for running off on my own. My pride and stubborn self-reliance has only ever bought me ruination. I turned my strider back towards where I'd left Nida, near the edges of this wheel. I set aside my own desire to recover the mineral wealth I'd lost once, and my half-memories of a previous life's pursuit of power. It was only this moment, and this chance to do something right for once in my miserable existence. I pushed the machine to its breaking point urging it into a full gallop towards the girl I'd abandoned to an unfair fight. As I recrossed that landscape, shame gnawed at me, for the way I'd reacted to the dream she had painted for me. She only wanted to show me a sunset on a world I was destined to tame. Far from these gardens, she and her people had kept alive for a future they never thought they'd see. Fear gripped my heart as I caught up with Nida near the edge of the wheel. I had to fight my overwhelming urge to retreat again. This close, I could plainly see how thin the glass was holding back all the land, water and air from the cold void beyond. The girl had dismounted her strider by some sort of metal podium. I climbed down off my machine to join her. She paid no mind to my approach and went on tinkering with something near the base of the podium. I fumbled for a pathetic apology directed at the back of her head, with no sign that she had heard me. Eventually. Nida stood up and touched a switch on the podium that opened a huge circular door in front of us. The girl climbed back onto her strider without word and headed through the doorway. I scrambled to catch up and follow her into the other wheel. All manner of steam and blinding lights played over us when we passed through a series of antechambers astride our colossal machines. At last, another of the circular doors opened and we passed through the portal into the befouled gardens beyond. The sticky sweet stink of this place was nauseating. We were confronted immediately by a vision of desecration. Corpses of the sky people hung on spikes and scattered about the entrance, a warning for any remaining interlopers no doubt. 
and my distance from Nida, her expression was unreadable, but I could imagine the girl's horror. This might prove to be all that was left of her crewmates. I dismounted to join her on the ground after she had climbed down from her strider. Her face was wet with tears, but she radiated a righteous fury that I identified with all too well. In silence, we buried her friends in the poisoned earth while our mechanical mounts shifted nervously above us on their bechromed hooves. Every moment spent in that unhallowed hellscape was a struggle to remain sensible. What I experienced was beyond trepidation. The place pressed on me, like skeletal fingers were squeezing my scalp. What had been done to the lands in that wheel was profane, a debasement of creation itself. Something was unmaking the natural order, melting it to fix into unholy new forms for some unknowable end. Bad enough that those poor sky people had been massacred, but we could see now that all their generations of endeavor had been undone. From horizon to horizon, Nida was inconsolable. Not that I was in any shape to give comfort. Not with that metronomic drone in my head, throbbing against my resolve. You know what you need to do, it said. I brought you back into this world. I can make you whole if you just do as I command. I forfeited all awareness of time and location in that toxic wasteland. No longer sure why we were there, or what Nida thought we could do at this point to roll back catastrophe. The thunder in my head exhausted me with demands for obedience, and at some point my waking mind fell into reverie. I was lost again in the flooded labyrinth under Alexandrea, shouldering my terrible burden to her final destination. There was an eerie light in the darkness ahead, a purpurate glow from a secret sepulchre. I dropped a guttering torch to the oily salt water lapping at my legs, to get a tighter grip on the insensible child I was carrying. In that hidden chamber, I offered her up as sacrifice. My lord promised vengeance against the cabal for banishing me. Was its intonation coming from the shadows in that remembered vault? The glowing violet blade I'd forged, or the defiled wheel that was carrying Nida and I into the void? I had no peace from the unceasing demands echoing in my mind. They seemed to be coming from everywhere. If Nida heard, she paid no mind. The girl was locked into some unknown course of action. Why wouldn't she share what she was planning with me? Couldn't she see I'd joined her to offer her what aid I could? At the same time, our unnatural surroundings seemed to be pulsing a warning at us. You are unwelcome here. Do not interfere. Still, the girl didn't react. She must have seen. How could she remain so fixed on her purpose? Finally, I couldn't abide the tension anymore. I signaled for her to stop and confer. We dismounted and met at the feet of our striders, though Mida kept her distance. I asked what she was planning, and she asked why I was shouting. She really didn't hear all the yowling. That was when those strange finned creatures attacked us. Just ahead of the attack, our striders sounded a shrill warning from on high. I was glad that Nida showed me how to rig our mounts with weapons at the ready because they were able to open fire on incoming predators while we scrambled for cover. Explosions erupted all around us, spraying us with goblets of the slimy ground cover. Nida began to run to our right, then changed her mind and ducked back to the left. She got on her hands and knees to dig in the muck underfoot, then turned to ask what I was waiting for. I helped her rip away the mats of gluey sludge to uncover a hidden hatch, just as the pride of attacking creatures crested the ridge above us. Their weird spiny manes thumbed with excitement as they spotted us. Nida pried open the hatch and we dove into the darkness under the landscape. The tunnels under that defiled garden wheel were pitch dark and fouled with sullage. I lost my footing and we sloshed hopelessly in the cataracts of sleech and putrescine that carried us leagues away from our attackers. We scrambled for purchase or handhold to slow our descent into the immeasurable depths, to little avail. We slid farther and farther into that mutulent duckwork, bits of floatsome devoured by a stingian monstrosity. It felt like untold miles of malignant vasculature were crushing out my instinct to survive, overwhelming me with dread. My wits caved in and I became desperate, mewling and crawling at the lining of those guts to escape. I found something sharp in my hand and tore through those thick membranes, discharging the girl and I onto a floor of an abysmal chamber. Exhausted beyond reason, I fell into unconsciousness. O Serpus, King of the Dead, Giver of Wealth, may my voice reach you in the depths of your Chthonic dominion. I am your humble servant, 
I who rename myself Lixion. Surely you are aware that all I have done was always, always in your honour. The other adapts cast me from their circle, forced me to steal their papyri so that I could build on their incomplete understanding of your arts. In dreams, you told me how to refine the purpureal metal that would grant me divinity with your blessing. I ask you now to lend me the power to escape this indignity. I gave you the girl, bled her at your altar and burned her in your heath. I freed her from her mortal tegument to reveal her holy energy. Soldiers of the Empire have me surrounded in your temple. I beseech you to grant me the transcendence I sought from your arcane knowledge when they find me and cut me down. Life returned to me with shrill brightness. Weakly but with increasing desperation, I pulled the tubes choking my airways. I was drowning in a viscous plasma and then a lid opened so that I fell from my metal cocoon. Blinded by the unaccustomed glare, a diamond protruded from the flesh of my forearm. I didn't understand. A moment ago I'd been in an afterworld populated by monsters. Now I was in some metal nursery of cocoons like my own. I wiped at the glass of one after another to see people suspended in fluid and shot through with tubes and wires. What was this place and how did I come to be here? Then there was a voice in my head, guiding me to a suit of supernatural armour. I put it on and the voice said, go now and find her. Wheels chasing wheels, a serpent devouring its own tail, oblivion the swallowing awareness, I woke again in the infernal throne room of my deliverer. His titanic excrescence exploded up the cavernous walls from floor to ceiling. Every part of this place was him, eyes bulging from ulcerated flesh to gaze down on us. Wounds become rectitudes of triumph grinning from on high, tensional limbs reaching for us from all sides. There were too many sides in that vertiginous cavity, an impossibility of angles that never met. I yelled to warn the girl, but of course she had already taken it all in. She was shouting her defiance up at the monumental face of our tormentor. His voice came from all around as a deafening chorus. He demanded that she submit and help him nurture his monstrous children by giving them new dreams. He demanded that I help him mine the garden for a precious resource he called Edmonium. Of course we refused. In the sarcoid cathedral of the anti-god, we endured his seismic wrath. Thunderous pearls of his fury buffeted us. Who were we to defy his cosmic magnanimity? He promised me that we would submit one way or the other, as something crawled up my back and attached itself to my head. I felt my will to resist being drained away, and fell to my knees as the entirety of our environment roared in triumph. It assured me I would go now to dig up more of the primer materia that it belonged to him. I remembered the elemental dagger clutched in my fist. I threw it to the girl. Go, I croaked with my dying strength. As darkness overwhelmed me, I heard the indignant howls from Nida as she fled. I hoped she would cut her way out and find a way to reverse this cycle of destruction. Creation deserves its rightful turn in the sun. And that concludes all of the notes from Gabrielle on Genesis Part 2. Of course, do let me know in the comments down below what you thought of the character of Gabrielle. And of course, I'm going to continue with one more episode from HLNA. I want to compile everything that she has to say along with the end cut scene so we can bring all of the notes and the story of Ark to its conclusion. And of course, leading up to Ark Part 2. So don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more Ark content from myself. But until next time, I'm James from Complete Games and I'll see you.